Well, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for joining me today. I'm really happy to have everybody here. Um, I did want to state right from the beginning that today's not really just a sales pitch of the book, but it's also hopefully a way to help you become a better designer, better typographer, and I'm hoping that you can take at least one thing away from this presentation today. Um, so let's start. So let's start with some fun stuff. Um, first off, you have the opportunity to win free books. And that is at the end of this presentation today, just like Laura mentioned, as well as um, I have a Twitter contest and a Facebook contest happening right now as we speak that will be ending at midnight tonight to um, also win a copy from Twitter and a copy from Facebook um, of your very own. So if you have an opportunity, you can go to my WordPress site down there at the bottom, denisebossler.wordpress.com to see more details of the contest. Um, I hope you enter because I would love to send out some books. Okay, so some more things to know. Um, where you can find me on the web. I'm available all over the place. I like to be available for my students, but I like to be available for other designers as well. The book has its own site. It's called masteringtype.com. Here is supportive materials from the book. There is an excerpt of the book on there, as well as uh, fun little bonus materials. There's one thing up now, and there's more coming soon. There's also some more information about me and about the book itself. So you can find that there. Bossler.com is my professional website. You can also, again, find me on Twitter, Facebook, and WordPress. This is me down here at the bottom, just in case you were wondering. There are still more things to know. So, so you know who I am before I get into the book. A few professional fun facts about me so that you know why I'm qualified to be talking about what I'm talking about today. I am a graphic designer and illustrator for the past 17 years. It's hard for me to admit that because I don't feel that old. But um, as a graphic designer, I specialize in brand identity and packaging. And as an illustrator, I specialize in licensing illustration for the gift and stationery industry. I have produced a lot of award-winning logo and packaging designs featuring hand-rendered and custom typography. Typography has always been a top priority for me in my design work. I'm Associate Professor of Communication Design at Kutztown University. I've been here this coming semester will be my ninth year. I teach graphic design and illustration to sophomore through senior level courses. And then last, I'm absolutely obsessed with proper kerning, bordering on psycho fanatical obsessed with proper kerning. It drives me absolutely crazy when I see poor kerning. So uh, my students know this, my friends know this, they like to point it out to me just to drive me insane. And yes, there is more personal fun facts, um, because I think everybody needs to know, you know, professional-wise, personal-wise, what goes into creating a book like this. So a few things. My passion with typography actually started at the age of two. My very first spontaneously uttered letter was Q, and that's also the first one I started drawing. It is still my favorite letter form today. I absolutely love the tail on the Q. And I end up sketching this letter first whenever I start doing artwork, regardless of the cue is in the artwork itself, um, just because I find that so much creative expression can be found in that particular letter form. A couple other little things. I love to play golf. I run half marathons. I read as many mystery novels as humanly possible. And I'm also a mom to my daughter, Carrie. And yes, there's even more. The last thing is, um, you have another opportunity to join me, and that is for my Howe Design University class called Mastering Type, or Mastering Typography. It's a four-week online typography course in which you're going to learn about the organization, relationships, composition, method, message, experimentation, and expressive typography to solve complex visual problems. There's a little bit of design history. There's a little bit of theory. But there's a lot of opportunity to broaden your understanding of type and dig in and push the limits of typographic creativity. So if you have the opportunity to join me, I would love that. So that's all there is about that. Let's get into the book. Why write another typography book? 
this is something that several people have asked me. Uh, and as one friend, non-designer friend put it, why the heck does anybody need a whole book about fonts? And I had to laugh about that. Um, I love all the typography books that are out there. There's a lot of good ones. I have them all on my shelf. But what I found in my teaching experience is that not one book approached the way, approach type the way I really wanted to approach it for my class. Um, these are sophomores in college. These are the kids that I'm teaching. They're 19 to 20 years old. They have had no other exposure to typography other than the fonts in Microsoft Word. So I needed to approach a way that would work with their experience level, which is zero. So what I decided to do is break down the systematic progression um, of learning type the same way that children learn to read. And that is you have to understand letters before you form words. You have to understand words before you form sentences. And then you have to form sentences, bef learn sentences before you can form a paragraph and before you can form a page. And I wanted to make sure that that progression happened in a way that the students would understand everything they needed to know before they progressed on to the next level. And that way they got to understand the intricacies and relationships of letters, words, sentences, and paragraphs um, to better their design skills. And so what I ended up doing was starting to write my own materials for the class. And they ended up loosely resembling chapters in a book. Not intentionally, they just kind of happened that way. And my students began encouraging me to write a textbook. One even wrote in one of those professor rating sites that my textbook was amazing. And that really made me laugh, but it also really made me think. Um, one, it wasn't even a textbook, so that's kind of why I started to laugh. But it made me think that, you know what, this actually could be a really great idea. So I started querying publishers, and how is one that found interest in it? And it progressed much more than where I really started and became more of a design resource, a typographic and design resource instead of just a textbook. And it's become something that everybody can use and find really useful. So that's why I wrote it. So who is the book actually for then? So I mentioned it is for professors, but it's for something else. It's for the rookie designer. So if you're a type rookie, um, this is a really great book for you because it will engage you in understanding how typography looks, feels, and reads. Um, it contains the basics, and it contains everything that you need to know to take letters and eventually turn them into pages. It's also, though, for the guru. For those of you that are out there that are design professionals that are seasoned, um, who know type and who understand type really well, it is absolutely a great reference for you because it is filled with the basic information, but at the same time, it also has practical and inspirational reference for you as well. And it's also um, chock full of phenomenal design examples, um, really, really wonderful type design examples at the back of every single chapter, um, which is really wonderful. It's also for the professor and or student. Um, it's really great for them because they can enhance their type and design class curriculum through the content, the examples, the interviews, which I'll get to in a minute, and real-world projects that are found in the book. Um, everything is there to support course content. Um, it's also there to support type theory. And it also backs up theoretical content with advice on applying that content to actual designs. For instance, in the page chapter, um, I talk about the theory of page design, and I back it up with advice on applying it to, say, annual reports, commercial lists, and magazine design. So I think this book is very well-rounded so that it can apply to everybody. OK, so that's enough about the book. Let's talk about type. I think we know this already, but it has to be said. Typography is absolutely everywhere. Um, it is there when you wake up in the morning and you go to hit your alarm clock. It is there when you open up the refrigerator to start making your day's meal. It's there when you find what you want to eat, such as my fresh white eggs here that I'm going to make for the morning breakfast. It is there when I pick up my juice and my milk. It's there when I fill up my daughter's bottle. 
It's there when I get my dose of caffeine for the day so I can keep going. Um, and then it doesn't stop. It continues on grabbing my keys, grabbing my phone, because of course we all check our phone first thing, getting into the car, driving down the road. It's all there. Some professional, some not, but we are bombarded by it absolutely everywhere. Um, the more we go about our day, the more items we see that have typography on it. And whether we realize it or not, we are actually exposed to hundreds and thousands, and it's more than the thousands, of type-based communication every single day. And therefore, it's really, really important for us as designers to make sure that the, typo the typography that we're exposed to, especially if we have control over it, is done the best possible way. So with all of that, with all of these things that we see every single day, there's really, really good typography out there, such as this example. Um, there's expressive and ornate typography. This is from Ken Barber of House Industries, who is an interview in Chapter 2. It can be very, very simple and clean, such as this particular example from Holly Tinkin, who is the interview in, design, in Chapter 3. She's from Design Grace and Bag the Habit. This beautiful, clean, clean illustration, as well as typography. Jessica Hish, um, traditional book cover. Jessica has done amazing typography work. Um, she's an interview in Chapter 4. Or you find really cool typography in a very non-traditional form, such as this non-traditional Manhattan subway line map from uh, Chapter 5 interviewee Amanda Geisinger. You have vintage-inspired typography, such as this particular book cover by Stephen Brower, who's our interview in Chapter 6, and this gorgeous um, web-based typography, especially ones that incorporate new web type technologies, such as this one from Jason Santamaria, who's an interview in um, Chapter 7. We also have work that can start as a gorgeous sketch and work its way to beautiful and delicate letter forms. We have the finalized version of illustrative numbers and we um, have hand rendered things that are absolutely gorgeous. We have more hand rendering that is a little bit more primitive almost that can really influence and inspire we have the familiar typography that's been reinvented. We have inspirational typography that will help you get them to go to school, to want to learn, to believe. We have typography that's just plain fun, that is really beautiful. And then we have typography that's integrated into space. This is all great typography. Unfortunately, we also have poorly executed typography. This is just bad. Really good example of just bad. Using dumb quotes instead of smart quotes. Terrible rivers. Terrible kerning. Horrible kerning. Atrocious kerning. Kerning that's way too tight, so it goes the other way. Um, really poor font choice even on a major brand. Um, really poor font choices, I say plural, both in the same space or within one logo space. I don't even know what to say about this one. Um, TV is not immune to poor typography either. Um, this is an awesome logo and it has such terrible letter spacing. And even my favorite show's logo is terribly current. Um, and it's so, so incredibly important to notice both the good typography and the bad typography so that we know how to make a proper decision. So ultimately, what it comes down to is it all starts with letters. We ultimately rely on the same 26 letters um, over and over and over again. Yes, we have punctuation and other glyphs and numbers, but it's ultimately those 26 letters because these letter forms definitely rule our lives. 
these letter forms um, form the words that form the paragraphs and sentences and pages. So let's start with letters. Each character is unique. Um, they have their own sound, their own shape, their own characteristics, um, their own form, such as these. Um, understanding these individual characters is really necessary to learning how to use typography. Why? Because each and every letter in the alphabet needs to live and breathe on the page on its own. It has to call to the viewer, it has to connote meaning, and it has to be um, understood in its own individual way, whether it's the historic family that it comes from so that it can influence a design, or its individual parts, um, so that you can properly pick out the right letter form for the right logo for the right message. Letters then form your words. So just like letters, people also form relationships. And these relationships are very, very important to people. People communicate using words, and therefore it goes back to the letters again. The letters form words. We all have this relationship that needs to work well and make sense together. Um, forming words gives letters a sense of purpose. So we use the words to communicate a lot of different things. Emotions, actions, people, places, things, descriptions. Words are essential to our everyday experience. They convey needs and desires. Um, different people, though, interpret words in different ways. So it's the designer's job to communicate a client's words so that they're interpreted correctly. So in some cases, words act as a support to the design, while other times, words themselves are the whole design. As far as sentences go, um, letters form words, and then words come together to form sentences. And these are, are the primary means of communication in the modern world. Their thoughts, their ideas, their messages, they are all forms of communication. And it's our job as a designer and typographer to make sure those messages come through loud and clear. Um, as with letters and words, the right relationship, of course, is really, really important within, within the elements in a sentence. And it's essential to understand how to put these sentences together to ensure really good communication because ultimately that's what we need to do. We need to convince, we need to inform, we need to declare, question, exclaim, tell. Um, and the sentence can be simple or complex, but in all cases the typography has to reflect what's being said. Sentences then come together to form paragraphs. They explain, they tell stories, they influence, and they convince. Um, a sentence might hook a viewer into a design, but it's the paragraph that keeps them there. So this is a really heavy load to bear for this particular type of typography being paragraphs. Um, few designs out there in the market don't rely on paragraphs. If you look at food packaging, a car brochure, a play poster, a credit card offer, um, even a fire extinguisher label, all of these examples require very, very different approaches to designing paragraphs. However, at the same time, the theory behind creating these paragraphs is exactly the same. Then you have your page. Um, the headline is written. The imagery is selected. The body copy is set to Garamond. The headline is set to Trade Gothic. The color palette might be lime green, orange, and brown. The size is an 18 by 24 inch poster. You have all of your decisions, and now it's time to put them together. Um, think of the page as a container, really, that holds all of the information. And how you put everything in this container is going to be up to you to make sure that whatever you do with it communicates really effectively. It can be really neat and orderly. It can be very fluid and organic. But the types, treatment, and arrangement within the space can make the difference between a viewer understanding it or not understanding it. Okay. And then to follow up page is screen. And technically screen is a page, but it is a little bit different um, in terms of execution. 
the digital environment is totally integrated into our lives. Everything from email and the weather to a medical diagnosis and online magazines and apps and games and all kinds of things can be accessed on a screen. So the goal of everything that we see on the screen is exactly the same um, as we see it on paper. It still has to communicate. Communication requires really sound typographic decisions. And this is why the theories and the principles behind typography design is exactly the same for both print and screen. The only difference is how it's ultimately executed, the technical end of it. So strong type theory will result in really great execution of type no matter if you're on print or you're on screen. So with that, with our letters, words, sentences, paragraphs, pages, and screens, um, we have all within this that typography is expressive. We see it out there all of the time. The right font can say the right message. So for instance, um, go, right here, little tiny go, set in Gil Sands on this screen, it's 42 point. It tells me that I need to take action. But it's not a hurried action. It's a request. It's a little bit urgent, but it's just saying, hey, go. On the other hand, go set in Gil Sands bold italic 288 point makes me jump up from my chair and set to the task immediately and with urgency. It's all about the connotation of what you're seeing that will communicate the message appropriately. For instance, the wrong type can make a good company look very, very bad. Um, it's all in the message that you're saying verbally in addition to visually that will make or break a design. At the opposite end, the right type can make a bad company look very, very good. So we have to make sure that we make the right connotative expressions with our type in addition to what our type actually says. So I want to, want to kind of break in here for just a second. All of the image examples, by the way, that you're seeing in this presentation are from the book. And these were generously submitted to me by designers from all over the world um, for possible inclusion. So everything you see here is part of what you're going to see in the book. Okay. So back to typography is expressive. Type can go beyond, this is why I love type so much, type can go beyond simple connotation and become whatever it is we're trying to communicate in, in literally. So it can become honest, or it can become Christmas, as in the lower right-hand corner. It can become winter, or it can become velvet, or lakes. It actually can become these things. It can also become um, an expression of art. It can become something that we use to decorate our wall or admire for, our be for their beauty. I love when I get a design piece that I can actually feel like I want to put up on my wall or a design piece that I don't want to throw away because it's absolutely that beautiful. I want to hold on to it. Um, and that's always our goal as a designer, to make the audience want to have it, to covet it. Um, and we can even go a step beyond that. And we can say that the typography can actually become the subject of art. It can become a bracelet or a painting or a kite. And that's even more exciting when typography can integrate into all aspects of art. Typography is also interactive in addition to being expressive. Okay? New, free, sale, best, better, even better, um, fresh, delicious. Okay? These words are really powerful and persuasive. When designed correctly, these words can provoke a person to action. They can make somebody do something. And that's why type can be interactive. Um, it can ask us to do all kinds of things. It can ask us to rebuild, um, to take a day off from work, to go visit an exhibit or a show or a concert. It can ask us to donate. It can ask us to be kind to the environment. Type has a lot of power. In addition to the message, the expression of the type can really um, hold sway over somebody. 
We can also talk about literal type interactivity, uh, the kind that we find on our electronic devices. Our computers, our smartphones, our tablets, um, our other digital devices, no matter what you have, are never far out of reach. And these devices are often the very first thing we check when we get up in the morning and the very last thing that we look at when we go to bed at night. We want to make that digital space our own. Um, we want to customize how it looks, and we want to rely on designers to help us do that. Um, even designers want other designers to help them do that. And great typography within this particular virtual space can really make the difference between somebody making a quick view at something or somebody staying for a long time within a site and doing some exploration. Um, what's really exciting, too, is the fact that we can touch type in the Internet and virtually touch it and have it react to our touch is really super exciting, um, especially now where we have the opportunity to create so much more with our typography on the web with the introduction of being able to use at font base font hosting services and using live text within our designs. So the type can move and shift and change and become part of the page as opposed to just a graphic sitting there. And I think it's a way that we can use type to get our audience to interact on such a deeper level now that we have a lot more control. Of course, from a design end, it's also a lot more fun to be able to design with it now that we have so much more opportunity to use type. Type is captivating. Um, it's absolutely expressive. It's absolutely um, interactive. But type is captivating. Type inspires people to do things. Typography has obviously been around for a really long time. It's really the last 100 years or so-ish that um, typography has been acknowledged that it has a role in captivating audiences. Uh, you talk about some art movements such as constructivism, Art Nouveau, Art Deco, the Bauhaus, and other movements um, really created monumental and influential work with their typography. They caused revolutions, they caused people to take notice, they caused these movements to happen, um, in addition to the artwork that was created. These movements still greatly influence designers today. So just like with fashion design, graphic design and illustration design is cyclical. Everything comes back around. Personally, I've noticed a lot of um, clean Art Deco inspired poster work as of lately, very much like the Holland America line poster in the lower left hand corner. I also see um, a lot of the 60s psychedelic inspired poster work of, t of, of that time period today, especially if you look at gig posters and a lot of things like that. The style and the movements and the color and the arrangement and the type and the use of everything really has come back. And you'll find that even fat famous designers and famous people that design type all cite influences from history. So it's really important to know your type history so you can figure out how to captivate your audience the way that they did, um, in your own way, of course. So whatever the influence, um, the right combination of type and form and layout and visual tone and color and other elements is determined, once you have all of that together, the possibilities are really endless for creating captivating and influential design, whether it's an invitation or it's packaging or it's a book cover or it's a you know, playful ampersand. It's all of the combinations of things that come together to make somebody take notice. And that's very, very, very important because you can learn a lot about typography and you can learn a lot about letters and you can learn a lot about words 
but if you don't know how to put everything together on the page or put everything together in a way that is going to be presented, you're going to have difficulty captivating your audience. So while typography in and of itself is a specialty area, you have to understand all the other areas around it in order to use it effectively. So it has to become something that's going to intrigue you or enchant you or influence you or make you covet a product or make you want to keep it on your desk and out of the trash can. And these are all the elements that you need to take note of to influence your own next typographic design project. Look at everything around you. What inspires you? Is it sans serif type? Is it serif type? Is it a particular combination of colors such as um, cyan and hot pink? Is it an illustration style? Is it a photographic style? All of these things we need to take note of and keep in the back of our mind as our little design notebook and remember what captivates us so that we can therefore in turn help to captivate somebody else. Speaking of captivating, um, sometimes so strong is the influence of typography that it captivates the audience in a not so positive way. Um, the public can react negatively and vehemently when type is used in a way that they find distasteful. I bring up these three examples here because they are well documented examples and while only one company shown here backed down from their logo redesign, all three of these logos still light up message boards and blogs um, over the poor nature in which they were executed. Um, I could go on about why each one is not successful. You may like one of these up here, but what we have to understand is that we're not designing in our own little world. We have to remember that the audience is part of our design and part of the interaction that happens when you put your typography and your design work out there. Um, typography has a lot more to say about a company or an event that sometimes even the people involved realize. And you have to not necessarily be influenced by the public, but understand the public's needs in order to make sure that whatever change you are making, especially to an iconic brand such as this, um, is going to be accepted by the general public because what you don't want is negative sway on your brand or your design or your idea. You want everything to be positive. Of course we do. We all want positive reinforcement. But when you're taking on something that um, has the potential to influence the public in a very strong way, and whether it's an advertisement even, or a brochure, or an annual report, we have to make sure that we are giving the typography its due diligence in creating something that will be acceptable to everybody involved. Sometimes that involves compromises, sometimes it involves experimentation and really going out there. But in any case, the typography needs to have the dedication, almost the same dedication you would give to color in a design. And that's saying a lot. So really, where does this all lead? Um, it ultimately comes back to letters. It comes back to the basics of the basics, the letters and the forms that they create. And it could be the thickness or thinness of strokes. It could be the style of the terminal. It could be the very delicate or the very bulky serif found at the bottom of the letter form. It could be the very, very subtle or very dramatic bracket that holds a serif onto the stroke. It can be the specialty identifying features of these special letter forms. But it all comes back to these simple 26 little forms, these little shapes, these little squiggles that we put together to do almost everything we have in our homes, in our stores, on the paper in front of us, on the keyboard in front of your computer. This is what it comes down to. Um, Sometimes it's really down to a single letter, such as a lowercase a, 
I've had that happen many times to me where I'm influenced for a logo design by a single letter because I just find it that beautiful. It could be the slope of a shoulder that ends in a teardrop ball terminal, such as the very lower right-hand corner A. Um, it could be the very tall, compressed closed counter that evokes the best connotation for the particular project that you're working on. Um, allow the letter forms to speak to you and to speak to your audience. Um, and in, in my case, it always comes back to the, the capital Q. My favorite letter is that gorgeous tail that has so much expression within it that I can't help but want to make the expression of everything else that I'm designing hold up to what the capital Q is giving. And that's expression, it's giving me emotion, it's giving me connotation. And really what it comes down to is type has influence. Type has influence over absolutely everything that we do. So what you want to do is if you need your type to have influence, make it a priority to learn how you can influence your type so that you can become a better designer and create good de design down to the letter. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Um, that was very informative. Um, we've got some questions lined up. Um, but I also just wanted to remind people that if you have a question that you would like to ask Denise, you can just submit that in the right-hand side of your screen in the questions box. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, so as a designer outside of kerning, what do you use as a barometer for determining whether typography is good or bad? I think the communication to the audience is my number one thing that I use to determine whether it's, I don't necessarily want to say good or bad, but well done or poorly executed. And it's who the audience is. If it communicates effectively to that particular audience, then I consider the type well done. If it does not communicate to the audience that it's intended for, then I consider it poorly done. Um, you always have to remember your end audience, unless it's your own personal project. Then you can use whatever you want. Yeah. What do you find that that are the common pitfalls for type pitfalls for professional designers. You know, as people have been working and, and you know have, have have numerous projects under their belts, you know, what are the pitfalls that you see professional designers falling into and, and how can they be avoided? Um, that's actually a great question because I get asked that a lot. I think the number one pitfall to professional designers is deadlines. And I know that sounds a little um, far fetched, but not necessarily. The deadlines influence us to make poor type decisions. Um, sometimes when you have a job, and I've been there, where it comes in at 8 o'clock in the morning and it has to go out by noon, we tend to let typography slide just a little bit. We tend to let the details in particular slide, such as the kerning, my pet peeve, um, good letting, uh, great tracking, and um, Things such as you know page design, such as jumping horizons or tombstoning, which is where elements don't necessarily line up where they're supposed to, or um, indents that are a little bit larger than they should be, or space between paragraphs that are a little bit too big or too small. There's itty bitty, teeny tiny little type details that a lot of times get pushed aside when we're under such a tight deadline and the client is breathing down our neck and we have to get it out the door. Um, is there always a solution to that? No, of course not. Sometimes you really just have to get it out the door. But even if you can take five minutes before you send it out, just to check over all of those little detailed nitty-gritty things, I think that um, all those pitfalls of um, regrettable pitfalls um, of poor design that happen can be avoided. And then what tools can you use to help make the connotations that you mentioned when you're trying to capture that, that right expression? You know, um, do you employ anything specific to help kind of make those kind of relationships, um, kind of reveal those relationships? Um, that, that's interesting. I don't know if I employ any techniques other than studying the letter forms themselves. If I want to connote something really exciting or really fun, I look at the letter forms themselves to see if they even look exciting or fun. Not that I want them to be crazy and jumping off the page, 
but are the letter forms beyond the simple aerial or times? Do they have um, a twist to them? Do they have a little bit of personality? Are their shapes just a little bit different or a little bit more exciting than the normal go-to fonts that you normally have? Or if I want to make something that has a lot of expression or a lot of excitement or some boldness to it, I'll go and look for letter forms that have those particular characteristics. So instead of using the regular Bodoni, I go to Bodoni poster so it's nice and thick and bold and exciting. Some, one of our listeners um, was thinking about um, kind of fonts that become overused. And I think a lot of time when people are making choices, they want something somewhat unique. But, you know, trends happen and, and, and things do start appearing more and more. They use the example of Bleeding Cowboy. I'm not familiar with that particular uh, font, but is the, he, she asks if the only recourse is to use custom le lettering or the classics. Um, no. No, I don't think it is. I agree that there are definitely lettering trends out there. Um, there are ones that you want to avoid. I see no your face everywhere. I think I pronounced that right. I see that everywhere right now. For a while there, it was copper plate. There are so many incredible typefaces out there that I don't necessarily think that we have to say it's all or nothing. I think the trick is to discover, to make a list of all the really awesome type houses out there, everybody that distributes fonts, both free and pay, that if, and I, again, I am not actually familiar with Bleeding Cowboy either, but what we need to look for are ones that have that same expression but look different, that's, that still project the same feeling that it has but are different or new. It could be going back to the classics. It could be going way back um, to the really old fonts. But it's also all about exploring. And I think becoming familiar with what is out there is really, really important, even if it means on a weekend scrolling through Veer for four hours just to see what's out there um, so that you don't necessarily have to rely on hand lettering type if you're not that comfortable doing it. You mentioned kind of the throwbacks and some of the more nostalgic treatments that have come back into fashion and that do. Uh, do you find that when that happens that they're kind of freshened up or are people really remaining kind of um, you know, true to that original kind of design. It, you know, a lot of times when we see uh, kind of the old come back into the contemporary co contemporary culture, it's made new in some way. I find that uh, a lot of the things that have influence of, say, the past movements, the past art movements, are really fresh, which is really great to see. You can see the influence because of the way, perhaps, that they use type or color or arrangement. But the subject matter, I think, dictates a lot of the freshness in it, which is very exciting to see. So I find, as a whole, that um, the art movements are really just an influence and that people have really, truly made it their own. Absolutely. Um, one listener actually asked, what font you used in your presentation? <laughs> oh, it's called Museo Slab. I got it from Font Squirrel. Great. And then, um, what is your rule with kerning? Um, since you kind of um, are very particular about it, do you, how do you approach kerning and making sure that it's just right? I approach kerning, one, it has to be the job. So I kind of determine right away whether it's loose kerning, medium kerning, or tight kerning, depending on what the particular job is. The bigger the letters, the tighter the kerning. The smaller the letters, the, the looser the kerning can be because you need to really have good legibility throughout and good readability. My rule is, well, here's how I go about it. Um, my rule is everything has to match one set of letters within whatever it is I'm kerning. So, for instance, you see mastering type Q&A. I would love to have kerned this better. Unfortunately, some presentation software doesn't allow that, and it's really driving me crazy looking at this right now, especially between the ampersand and the A. Um, but what I do is I tend to pick out the two letters that I think look really great and really comfortable and that I think are perfect. And then I go to the left of that and to the right of that. And I move my letter forms back and forth and back and forth until I find that the entire word represents the kerning that I liked between those two letters. So for instance, in mastering, say it's the E and the R, I really like that. 
I'll go back and forth to either side of those letters, making sure that everything else is the same. And then I take that and I apply it to the word type, and then I'll apply it to the word Q&A, so that the whole thing has a very equal feel um, throughout all of its kerning. Is there a hard and fast rule about how far apart the kerning should be? Absolutely not, because the design dictates what it should look like. Um, but I really strive to have everything totally even on the entire page. One of the poor examples that you kind of cited earlier, um, one of our listen listeners said it was kind of um, an ebook, and it was uh, used to demonstrate rivers. And, and she asked kind of how as designers do we address the sacrifice um, that we sometimes have to make in design you know, due to the limitations caused by technology? Well, I think that's, that's a rush of very good words, sacrifice. We do make sacrifices a lot. And I think the one that I did show, because it was driving me crazy when I saw it, is that we need to work better as a designer with whoever's developing the technology to not have to sacrifice anymore, um, to not have to succumb to horrible rivers and justified text. And that is not necessarily something that we all can do like today, right now, and have influence over that. But if we're talking about, you know, ebooks aside, we do have a lot of control, especially over device specific software and device specific designs because of the really the, the forward movement of HTML5, of CSS3, of all of these technologies that are starting to be incorporated that are giving the control back to us. So while we may not have all the control that we want, especially such as in a, a book in, on our iPad and the iBook, um, we really need to kind of work and push the technology as best as we can to not have to sacrifice so much anymore. Well said. And then, you know, sticking with technology, um, when you're, how does your approach to type change when you're working with a project like you, when you, you know when you're talking about an interaction where somebody's touching the word and it's something's happening does that does it change for you in any way uh, in that instance it doesn't no um, I, I mean, call me old school but I still treat type the same way I do on the page um, in fact I design everything on the page before I even hit the screen um, and I mean print versus you know web or print versus screen technology it doesn't change because the ultimate goal is still communication and showing the correct communication for what I'm trying to do with that page. So everything that for me that goes into screen design in web design or in app design is exactly the same as I do in print design. It's all the same. We have, we had a lot of um, kind of questions about kind of type resources. Um, you know, obviously there are plenty of um, fonts and packages available for purchase, but there's also a lot of, um, you know, free resources out there. Which ones do you think are particularly strong? For, for purchase or for getting fonts? For free. Google Web Fonts is a great one. Google has um, really pushed the web font front a lot. And in fact, I just wrote an article that Hopefully you'll be seeing soon on the How blog about free fonts. So I think the Google Web Fonts, Font Squirrel is a great one. Not everything on Font Squirrel is free, but there are a lot that are. And such as Museo Slab, which I have up here, I think some of the font is free. I purchased the whole thing, though, so I could have the entire body. There are all of the major font distributors, such as My Fonts, there's fonts.com, there's Veer. They also all offer free fonts within their sets. Um, even though they have pay ones too, they all offer free ones. Uh, let's see. The rest are not coming to me right now. Those are all good ones. Um, they're, they're great. They're great. And if you type in, if you do a Google search, for instance, for uh, quality free fonts, you're going to find a lot of blog entries pop up oh, sure. of other Link. designers that give some really great resources for free fonts. 
we have someone who you know works with clients a lot and when you're working whether it's I guess on a, a branding or, or any project really uh, and you've selected a font but you know sometimes clients feel like it, it needs to be punchy or jump off the page or they have some idea about it needing to be super exciting when if you know when re in reality very simple fonts can do a lot of really exciting things so how do you work with a client in those kind of situations Oh, I love these situations. This when you want to strangle your client. Um, <laughs> no, I, I do, and I do totally understand that. And I think what I've tended to do with clients like that is I've gotten into the habit of, even though it's a mock-up, of showing the client the logo type and the environment in which it's going to be seen. So if it's going to be end up on a T-shirt, I superimpose it on a T-shirt in a really crowded environment. Or if it's going to be on a package, I superimpose it on a package in a very crowded environment so that they can see that the simplicity of the font is really the thing that's going to make it stand out amongst all the clutter. Um, and yes, it's a little bit of, I would call it added value to your design, so you were hired to do the logo, but at the same time I need to prove to them that the logo is really going to work in the environment in which it's going to be shown. And at the same time, if you're, if you're a good designer, and I'm, I'm sure you are, uh, we need to talk about the letter forms themselves. And I find that, I keep coming back to the letters, but if you talk to them about the letters and why the letters themselves are so exciting, even though they seem simple, it can really go a long way. Very cool. Well, uh, we have some questions that we weren't going to be able to get to, but I want to make sure that we get to announcing the winner for um, today's free book giveaway. Um, and. I'll announce the name, but also I just want to let that person know, too, that uh, I'll kind of connect with you via email after the presentation to get your contact information to get the book shipped out to you in the next week or so. So uh, today's winner is Maria Giuliani. So I will uh, connect with you via email and get your address so that I can get you the book uh, in the mail. And then also, um, if you didn't win, uh, you can get 20% off the book in My Design Shop, um, which is mydesignshop.com, when you use the code MTYPE and the number 20. So that's MTYPE20. And that code and a link to mydesignshop.com um, will also be included in the email that you receive uh, thanking you for today's attending today's virtual book signing. Um, and then if you're interested in Denise's upcoming How Design University course, uh, just visit HowDesignUniversity.com for more information, and if you register with the code DBOSSLER, you can get $40 off the cost of tuition. So a couple perks for attending today's session. And then on the site, um, just as an FYI, you'll see the course is available uh, starting July 30th, uh, but then uh, just to let you know that it will also be offered in October and December. So if you can't make it this summer, then check out uh, the course later this year. So that's all I've got. Um, Denise, thanks so much for your presentation. I think it was really informative. I appreciate you joining us today. Thank you very much. And thanks to everybody um, who tuned in. So that's it, uh, and have a great day. Bye-bye.